Hello, and welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. Uh, both those in-house uh, sessions and those that are connected to us virtually. This is our opening session of the new year uh, after several weeks break for the holiday season. We have finished our year-long study of the Corinthian letters and now turn our attention to another New Testament book, one that's historically been entitled Epistle to the Hebrews. As always, I urge you to have a good study Bible uh, as you go through, and uh, we use several uh, in, in the in-house session. And But I will uh, be using primarily uh, commentaries to guide my thoughts and, and uh, lectures here. We will start uh, with two to three, uh, two for sure, maybe three introductory sessions uh, to prepare us for the study. The late Dr. Fred Craddock uh, is a renowned disciple or was a renowned disciples minister, a scholar and professor at several institutions, but in late uh, and lastly at Emory University. Uh, he wrote a good compendium uh, on the book of Hebrews, uh, reviewing the scholarly literature all the way up to 1990. I will rely most heavily on that particular compendium uh, to guide me, but will supplement his work with others, especially that of Dr. Peter O'Brien, uh, compendium which was published in roughly 2010. He, uh, he's an Anglican scholar uh, from Australia who uh, reviewed the literature fo uh, mostly from the period Craddock finished until 2010. Uh, a few other scholars' work uh, will also be used as I need them to supplement theirs. Dr. Craddock's compendium opens with a very critical and important point that I think we should appreciate throughout this study. He writes, not all books of the Bible have contributed equally to our Christians' beliefs, ethics, and liturgy and Hebrews is surely a real case in point. Our willingness and ability to understand and properly interpret its message have been hampered. Other scholars go even further and say Hebrews has been badly misinterpreted by the church historically. Moreover, it has been wrongly interpreted to support a theology called supersessionism, which is that idea that Christians replace Jews as God's chosen people, and the New Testament has been uh, has replaced the old, and the new covenant has made the other covenant, old covenant, if you will, void. Craddock adds also, while Hebrews is invited uh, by the church to speak on occasions, and some of those are high occasions, such as Holy Week and in some Christian Christmas songs, the church has not been as attentive to this voice to the level it should have. Dr. Jeffrey Syker, professor of uh, Jewish Christian studies at Loyola Marymount University has researched this area uh, and he has conclusions from his research are that the Christians have used Hebrews, the book of Hebrews if you will, to drive in part, and a large in part he says, a religion of disinheritance to the same God they worship, which has led to general persecution of Jewish people and their religion. Such scholarly comments drive me to want to learn all I can about Hebrews. What does it say? What does it not say? What is the best interpretation of what is in Hebrews? And what is its message? 
to Christians? Those are questions we need to open our minds to and ponder as we study Hebrews. And we study it in depth in this class and not just a quick read uh, passing through the Bible type event. There are 13 chapters, so it will take us several months uh, to go through this, this book. The King James Version labeled this book of the New Testament the Epistle of Paul, the Apostle to the Hebrews. The New King James Version titles it the Epistle to the Hebrews, as do several others. The Revised Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version just refer to it as the Letter to the Hebrews, while some entitle it uh, just Hebrews. What is going on here reflects that there are issues with both the title and who is the author of this New Testament book. The oldest Greek manuscripts found, uh, I should, should say the oldest Greek manuscript found, has the title in a different script from the rest of the text. Uh, and it says, just says, to the Hebrews. There's no reference to Paul there, just to the Hebrews. While later uh, manuscripts, but still very early, are have the entitled Epistle to the Hebrews. Hebrews is not a Greek letter uh, in style, according to respected modern literary scholars. Uh, the only place you get any idea that it might be a letter is from the title uh, and in the last two paragraphs of chapter 13, the closing chapter, there is something added there for transmittal that might resemble a letter. Instead, most say it is a sermon or homily of exhortation that was written for a particular audience. Only in the, in the last few verses, of the final chapter is there something resembling a closing of a first century Greco-Roman uh, letter. And it's interesting that we say, or that these scholars say, this, this thought is so complete. This is a written sermon. This is not a off-the-cuff sermon. This was a written sermon, written and then delivered. Many scholars speculate that this material was delivered as an oral sermon from a written script directed to a particular audience and was later shared with others via adding uh, a few comments uh, at the end. And those are likely to be from uh, another author rather than the original author, but that's not clear. O'Brien uh, says that uh, the author Hebrews demonstrates the greatest skill in first century Greek homiletics, uh, homiletic rhetoric particularly, found in the New Testament. Harper Collins editors uh, in their introduction to Hebrews says the Greek is the most sophisticated in the New Testament. The late Dr. Raymond Brown, a world-renowned uh, Catholic priest and academic scholar of Union Theological Seminary, which by the way is a Protestant seminary, uh, claimed Hebrews is the most impressive work in the New Testament when read in the Greek. He says it's lost something in its English translation, but in the Greek it's very impressive, he says. Dr. O'Brien, uh, who I mentioned earlier, he's an Anglican scholar, says it is a literary masterpiece, carefully constructed in high quality, first century Greek, used in the Greco-Roman period. It clearly was intended, he says, for those who had mastered the language and is colloquial at no point. 
He says there are many metaphors uh, used. However, uh, they are from the Hellenistic culture, uh, which was common to the Diospora Jews, or Diospora Hebrews, if you will. The Greeks and the Romans uh, all had had the same ideas in this culture relative to these metaphoric uh, points that are brought out. So they would have been familiar with them. The honor and uh, shame motivational scheme that was deployed that, uh, by Paul, but we saw especially in the Apocrypha writings, uh, is used here as well. It is most unfortunate that Christians throughout history have been so unsettled by the many warnings found in Hebrews is a comment from Dr. Craddock's compendium. Dr. Peter O'Brien adds in his writings, it does not seem, I mean, it does seem, he says, Hebrews does seem to contradict some assurances and promises made elsewhere in the New Testament, especially troubling from uh, from some is this teaching that Christians once saved can fall away from Christ. This teaching, more than any in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, seems to have led an avoidance of Hebrews by much of Christianity, except for some carefully selected scriptures, both he and Craddock uh, confirm. Dr. Timothy Johnson at Emory University, and he's still there by the way, he's still active, says this work of Hebrews clearly indicates that in the early decades of, Christian, of Christianity's movement, a remarkable mind, that is the mind that wrote Hebrews, and did the rhetoric of Hebrews, was a mind other than Paul's and therefore it's there were other great minds involved in interpreting the meaning and significance of the crucified and raised Messiah. And as he says, Dr. Johnson says, I find that very uh, helpful that there's information here from someone thinking deeply other than just Paul. Hebrews is an anonymous document. There is no direct indication of authorship or date or location found anywhere directly in the manuscript. The only indication of authorship is in some versions of the title. However, it has long been credited to Paul, but not in the beginning, nor is it now. But throughout most of Christian history, it has been attributed, Hebrews has been attributed to Paul. Modern scholars have concluded Hebrews is not the work of the Apostle Paul. A letter from First Clement in Rome, who wrote from roughly, uh, his earliest writings have been dated 96 AD and writing up to close to 135 AD, maybe even just slightly later, cites several sections from Hebrews in the Greek. He does not accredit an author when he cites Hebrews, while when citing 1 Corinthians, he does claim Paul as the author. Moreover, the Western branch of Christendom, early on, talking about before the division, was on record until about 300 AD, or slightly later, objecting to Hebrews being Pauline in origin. However, at the same time, the Eastern branch, uh, very early on, attributed it to Paul and has more strongly used Hebrews in its literature. <coughs> Excuse me. Some early Eastern writers uh, argue that Hebrews was in agreement with much of Paul's writing and his theology, and thus he was deserving. Their argument was he is deserving of it carrying his name. The Western Church argues, yes, there is some agreement, but there is also much and more important differences. 
Professor Donald Hagner at Fuller Theological uh, Seminary, which is in California. Uh, I think it recently moved from Pasadena to some other city out there. It says the evidence against Hebrews being Paul's is now overwhelming. Yet it would, yet it could well be that it is based on the general teachings and general theology that's been that's presented by Paul, or some of Paul's theology that hasn't come forth yet. With that, we'll close the first session. So I hope you uh, begin to read in Hebrews, uh, and we'll next week move into our second introductory session, concentrating primarily on how, when we think this was written based on scholarly input and what the audience might have been and some other general information. Hope you have a good week.